Willie D Live. It's Willie D, y'all. Back with another episode of information and instructions to help you navigate through this wild, crazy, beautiful world. In the studio, Dr. Boyce Watkins. What's happening, brother? What's up, King? Man, it's good to see you again, brother. What's oh, up? man, it's always good to see you, brother. I mean, you, you got a lot going on, man. You are an economist. You're an author. You are a political analyst. You're a social influencer. Do you like that title, social influencer? You embrace I, it. You know what, man? I I don't even live off titles like that. Yeah. I just I just exist, man. You know, I I don't I don't know what the fuck I am to be honest with you. I I just um, I I live through whatever God's purpose is for me at that time. Right. You know, and I and I, I state it that way because I feel like the universe just it pushes you in certain directions and there's certain things you're supposed to say and and I and I've tapped into that that internal energy. That says, okay, something's telling me to say this. I got to say it. Something's telling me to do this. I got to do it. And I believe in trust in that. You know what I mean? Because that that's like your, um, it's, it's the universal or high power, but it's also your subconscious mind, which is where all that really lives anyway. And it's pushing you in a certain direction. You know, right. it took me time to get to that point to really trust myself. That's why, for example, I can go, <clears throat> I can go online and say something that I know 99% of all people are going to disagree with. But if the signal's strong, you you just go with it. You know what I mean? And you know it's going to be okay. That's great. You are not afraid to go there. It's often said that a person who is a jack of all trades is a master of none. Mm. But somehow, man, it seems like you've been able to debunk that theory. How do you do it? How do you juggle so many things at once and is so good at all of those things? Uh, purpose, right? Uh, hard work. You know what I mean? Like, um, uh, every day is just, you know, like life is short. You know what I mean? Like we're all going to be dead soon and ain't nobody going to remember much of what we did. This is our time, you know? And so, um, if you're not living your purpose and really doing what you're supposed to do, you're, you're just wasting that time. You know, a lot of people do that. They get up, go to work, come home, go to bed, get up, go to work, come home, go to bed, and just repeat a process. And then you just grow old and die, you know. And, and, and I was determined to kind of break that pattern. And uh, so each day um, I think about the black community every single day, right? You know, my, my number one goal is, uh, and I think this is why we became friends, and I'm, I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you what you said to me that really let me know that that, that we should be friends, man, is – um, my goal is like as a black man to be uh, as free as possible, as strong as possible, and as impactful as possible. And I think you do that through courage. You do that through intelligence. You do that through strategy. Uh, you can't sit around and feel sorry for yourself. You just got to go hard with it, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'll I'll even say that that what led us to be friends was I remember you said something where you said, uh, "Ain't nothing you can do to me that I can't do to you." And I like that statement because I hear too many black men talk about what the white man could, he could do this and they going to do that and da, 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 da. And I'm like, but you can punch back too. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you have a divine power that really nobody can match. I, I don't think anybody can really match uh, a strong, smart, intelligent black man when he's at his best. I think when we're at our best, we become like real life superheroes. You know what I mean? And, and, uh, and, and, and I, I like that about you because you, I can see where you were tapped into that. You know what I mean? So, Ultimately, man, it's, you know, I think it's about playing offense, you know, in your life. You, you can't just play defense. You can't just be scared like, oh, what are they going to do to me next? And how, how are they going to attack me next? No, you play offense. Make them respond to you. You know, you ain't got to always respond to them. So there we go. Perfect. Let's go back to Louisville, Kentucky, your hometown, the hometown of the greatest, one of the greatest fighters that ever existed, yeah. Muhammad Ali. Have you ever met Muhammad Ali? Never met him, man. I feel like now, I how have. do you live? How are you born in Louisville, <laughs> Kentucky, and still have a connection in Louisville, Kentucky after all these years, yeah. and not have met the greatest? Because he he left Kentucky for the same reason I did. He left because the racism, you know, and 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 just uh, and 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 you notice you're from Texas, so mm -hmm. I mean that's probably worse, but. It well, was, I've never experienced a racial incident in my life. <laughs> I just want to say that out loud. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, man. It's We're like, post-racial in Texas, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, man. But it's, <laughs> it's like, it was like one of those things, man, where, you know, Ali left. Ali, 
he's he wasn't it wasn't like he was around when I was growing up. Mm-hmm. But he was a legend and everybody talked about him. My father would talk about him and and I would watch his movies and all that. And I remember he did that movie called The Greatest. Mm-hmm. Uh and actually there was a scene in that movie where they were in the Omni Hotel, I think, in Atlanta. And that's actually where we're having the all black national convention. And in fact, that's why I was excited when they found when they picked that hotel, when the team did. I said, Yeah, that was in the movie The Greatest. And the reason I think about that movie is because in that movie, when he was talking about, you know, I believe the children are our future and all that, I felt like he was talking about me. Like I felt like I was one of those kids that he was actually being courageous for to to clear a path for later, you know. So Ali was always a part of my spirit, man. I would I would read books about him and and my father bought me this uh thing where his handprints were in it. You know, I put my handprints up against his. He has real small hands, by the way. It was real surprising. And uh and so he was all that that Ali spirit definitely was there. And I remember when I would go through tough situations, I would look at his life and the stuff he went through. And I would be like, well, what I'm going through ain't nothing compared to what he went through. He fought through that in the 60s. I could fight through this in the 90s and the 2000s. So Ali was present. Uh, My grandmother went to high school with him. So she's got a lot of, like, just really uh, interesting but uninteresting stories about the family. Like, she'll, she'll talk about... Something random like, oh, oh, yeah, they live down the street and they, they would come down and eat the chicken. You know, just stuff like that. It's, it's like regular stories like that. But uh, the legend of Ali was always like a part of Louisville, man. And it was I was always very proud of the fact that this guy could come from the same town I came from and impact the whole world. That was real cool. You know, because Louisville ain't exactly a city that you talk about in daily conversation. You know, it's not like Chicago or New York or whatever. And the fact that this guy was around the world and had everybody talking about Louisville, man, that's inspirational. You know, so Ali was one of my greatest heroes. I, I know his daughter, you know, mm-hmm. um, but and, and, and her husband, uh, they're, they're real cool people. But I never met Ali. Which daughter? Uh, Layla. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the one that was the boxer. Well, I, I didn't. I didn't want to assume. I, I, no, no, no. I yeah, yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. He's, yeah. He's, he's got a few kids, I think. Let's talk about your earlier upbringing. You are the product of a teen mother. Mm-hmm. Shots out to shots out to Robin Couch. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, shots out to Robin Couch. Um, your father, your biological father, it said that you've only spoken to him like three times in your entire life. Your stepfather, who married your mother at the age of when you was three years old, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. This is Larry Watts, Watkins. Yeah. Larry Watkins was an interesting guy. He was a, a stern, uh, tough disciplinary who became a police officer. Yeah. Now, that is a very interesting dynamic to me when I think about the Boyce Watkins I know today. Mm-hmm. I can see the disciplinary side of you. But what I cannot see is the uh, that you the disciplinary side of you that came from your stepfather, because I'm I'm assuming that he had more of an impact on you than your biological father did. Yeah. What I can see is the systemic side of being raised by a police officer, mm. and the way that you hold police officers accountable for mm. their actions. Now, was there any? type of rift there between you and your stepfather at times where you thought that he was being too much of a, of a, you know, a controller? Well, I'm sure he wasn't happy when, when he came home one day and I was blessed and fucked the police on the, (laughs) on the, on the stereo system, you know? And, uh, and it's like, um, I, but I don't, I don't have that fuck the police mindset though. Um, what you learn when you see, uh, police work up close most people don't really understand the life of a cop. You know, we we judge it from a distance. But <clears throat> I saw different kinds of cops. I saw the good and the bad. I saw the black and the white. I saw the corrupt. And I saw the guys who just went out there and the women who went out there and put their lives on the line for perfect strangers. And the only diff- the main difference that, that I gained from being raised by a cop was um, the nuance of it. You know, that that it's, you know, there are systematic problems. The racism's real. You know, my father joined the force. He talks about how some of those guys were literally in the KKK on the on the force. And, and they told him we ain't going to hire no black people. And somehow he got the job. 
And he said that, you know, he talked about the blue wall, you know, because police are a gang. That's what they are. They're just the biggest, most powerful state sanctioned street gang in the city. And so that gang mentality um, was very similar to any other gang, you know, where um, you have codes of behavior, you know, no snitching, that kind of thing. So he said that blue wall was so strong that they would, th these Klansmen would defend my father before they just defend a random white guy on the street, you know, because it was about protection and safety and all this other stuff, right? So police corruption is, is real. Um, I think policing got real bad during the crack era when they put all those drugs in the black community, <clears throat> community and then they started weaponizing the cops. You know, they're doing all these terrible things to black people. Um, and so policing needed to be corrected for sure. Uh, what I think we have to do is understand the consequences of how we approach it, though. If you approach it like a bull in the china shop, then what you're going to do is, uh, which we, actually this did happen. Um, I knew a lot of good black cops. I knew a guy that was a police commander. I'd known him since kindergarten. He ain't waking up trying to kill black people. He, he's waking up trying to figure out how not to kill nobody. He just want to come home every day, do his job, protect the right people, whatever. Uh, he said black cops, he said black people do not want to be on the police force anymore because everybody thinks that if you black and you're a cop, you must be a sellout. So they're like, oh, I don't want to be a sellout. So what happened is that before, you know, on the police force, you would get some qualified candidates for the job, you know, college graduates, you know, people just trying to do the right thing or whatever. He said, now you're, you're, they're drawing like a much lower applicant pool. They're drawing people that don't give a shit if you call them a racist or not, or crazy people that really want to have a gun and tell people what to do. So the quality of the policing declined, I think, as a result of the fact that we were not careful about how we kind of address the issue. You know, but 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 there's a problem with policing and, and it's and it's more it's not to blame society, though. You have to blame the system. You got to understand the root of policing, how it was rooted in slavery. Uh, the, the racial issues were very real. So it had to be corrected. I just hope it gets corrected the right way, because if you don't correct it the right way, then that means that when you do need a police officer to help you, it's not going to turn out the way you think. And you see the spikes in crime in a lot of major cities. And I think it's all connected to how we handled it during the pandemic. I don't want to. I don't want some left wing socialist telling me how to deal with police issues. I want to talk to real people in the community who are clear about exactly what they want and what they don't want. So I'll give you an example. During the whole Black Lives Matter protest, you had a lot of weird shit going on where you would have uh, you would be in the hood and there'd be some person just know that nobody knows coming in and just randomly causing trouble, busting windows, setting shit on fire and all that. That's that radical left. You know what I mean? That's that organized part of it. And what I liked about Detroit was that the people in Detroit, when they were protesting, they identified those people and said, don't come in our neighborhood. We don't want you to make this into something that fits your agenda. We have a beef in, in an issue, a bone to pick, and we want to address it our way. We don't want outsiders coming to the city who are trying to instigate and destabilize the government, all this other stuff. So that's what people didn't understand was that there's that higher level agenda that happened. And I don't think it's good for the country. I want to make an appeal to all of those young people out there who might be thinking about becoming a police officer or who has scratched it off your list of aspirations. Let me tell you something right now. We don't hate black. We don't we don't hate black police officers. We hate bad black police officers, just like we don't hate white police officers. We hate bad white police officers. So if you have the right intentions, if you are for justice, if you are for community protection, we need you. We are going to respect you. We already respect those who are out there doing the work. I got people in my family who are cops. These are good guys, the ones that I know. I really don't know any family member that I have that's a cop that's a bad guy. He's out there. She's out there doing the work. They're out there respecting the community. They're out there running interference when they do see that Klansman who are trying to stretch his authority. They're stepping in and saying, no, nah, you can't do that. You're not going to do that. And they're on the scene and they're the eyes, they're the ears for us. So we need y'all. So if anybody's out there just putting a blanket statement out there that black cops are sellouts, now, you, the motherfucker, sell out. There you go. Because we need y'all. Yay, man. 
you ain't finna change nothing from the outside. You got to get in there. Right. And I do think the more black cops that we have, the more appealing it's going to be to do the right thing by people, by mm -hmm. our people. Because right now, for some black cops, they take the easy way out by acquiescing to racism. Mm -hmm. You know, they go along to get along. They get in the game and they say, you know what, it's easier for me to just roll with the punches and, you know, uh, be part of the status quo as opposed to coming in and trying to change things. So they have, we have to take away that incentive. If the more we take away the incentive for them to do the wrong thing, then all of those people that come in that's doing the right thing can have a better influence and impact on their decisions that they make when they're out there on the streets. Yeah, yeah. You know, with, with policing, if you ask me one thing that I observe that I think has to change is I don't think there should be any situation where the people policing the community don't have a stake in that community. You know, that are not from that community, don't that don't live there or have some connection. Because you take better care of things that you um, that you own or you're connected to, you know, you don't have no respect. If you're coming from the suburbs and you're coming down to the hood, and the only time you come down to the hood is when something bad's happening and you ain't got no respect for uh, the things that we hold sacred in our community, then you you are going to go in there and cause problems. You Especially know what I mean? when you've t been taught that these are bad people. Right, right, right. And so that, you go in with that implicit bias. There you go. There you go. And, and that's when it becomes, in many cases, it becomes a racial occupation where you've got all these white police officers in a black neighborhood. The only reason they're there is because they are police. Um, that's a problem because you don't see examples where you see a whole gang of black men, you know, in, in police uniforms raiding houses in white neighborhoods. That does not happen. So so that that's where it becomes like a military occupation or like a type of oppression. Right. So 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 we need police. We need good police that are going to really do their job. Um, I think that community policing definitely has to include that aspect of caring about the people and the places that you go. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to um, police people that uh, that I have a connection to the same as I would somebody who's a stranger. Yeah, absolutely. Man, how does a guy who struggles with grades you know, has poor performance at school, is told by his teachers that he isn't smart enough to go to college and who they put into a special ed class mm -hmm. become a professor at a college and a millionaire. The public schools are terrible for black boys. Just terrible, man. I mean, you know, the statistics show this. And not only are public schools terrible for black boys, they're really terrible for America. You know, the, I mean, the public schools were created uh, as indoctrination factories to get you caught up in the whole uh, go to college, go deep in debt, and then spend the rest of your life on the corporate plantation, almost like a sharecropper, working to pay off an impossible debt, right? That whole system is incredibly fucked up, right? But uh, the capitalists that run society... They were like, okay, how do we get people? Most people are trained to be sheep. Studies show that 70 to 80% of all people will follow authority even if they know the authority is wrong. Mm -hmm. you know, they'll, they'll, they'll just go along with the crowd even if they know the crowd is wrong. right? So most people in America are not trained to be free thinkers. They're trained to be systematic thinkers, and public schools are part of that. That's what it, you don't think about this. You get, you get rewarded for sitting down and shutting up. That's it. That's it. If, you just, if you just behave and just do what you're told— that's going to get you good grades. Get in conduct. Right, right. And that's and that's why most, uh, when they study like valedictorians, how many of those valedictorians go off and become millionaires and all that, they, they it's, it's, it's a very low number uh, because they're not uh, trained to do the, the kind of creative thinking that you have to do to really be really successful in America. To be successful in America at a high level, you got to get outside the fucking box. You have to, like systems and all of that, man, the systems are designed to benefit 
the system, right? So, uh, for example, the American economy, a lot of it runs off consumption, spending money, right? So that's why you're trained to be a consumer. You're not trained to be a saver and investor and all that. Uh, it also runs uh, off of people that are workers. You need workers, right? That was a problem with the pandemic. People, people actually found out what it's like to live a life where you're not spending all your time at the corporate plantation and they didn't want to come back to work. And they were like, okay, how do we trap or trick people to come back into work? Well, you know, things like debt and and, and all the financial insecurity that exists is part of that trap, right? So, uh, so basically, I struggled in the public school system because um, I, I just, you know, I, I think I just kind of, I didn't like being told what to do. Um, I did not relate to the teachers. You know, these were like white ladies from the suburbs. Um, I probably had a little ADHD. Uh, when I was five years old, my um, my mother, who was about 21 at the time, uh, she there was a young white lady that told her. She said, "When I was when we were in class, she said your son Boyce he he was he would never sit down. He would get up and stand up, walk around, and just interrupt disrupt the class." She said, "Before I would try to kind of scold him about it." She said, "But one day I decided I wanted to play a trick on him." So she said, uh, when he got up and he's sitting, he's standing up, walking around, doing whatever, I just ignored him. And I kept teaching. She said, I just kept teaching. And she said, when I got done, I was going to embarrass him by asking him to repeat everything I had just taught while he was distracted. And she said, and you know, your son recited every single thing that I put on that board. And so what this lady told my mother, which probably saved my life, and God bless, I don't know who this lady was. She said, when your son gets to public school, they're going to diagnose him with ADHD. And they're going to try to put him on medication. She said, do not believe them. Do not let them put your son on medication. Do not do that. So the whole time I was in school, my mother fought the teachers. And she's like, no, you're not putting him on meds. Ain't nothing wrong with him. My son is smart. My son is fine. And uh, and that's what protected me from what happens to so many of our of our children. You know, I think I think boys in general and maybe black boys, I think we're just different. And we don't always fit in those those systems because schools are kind of like prisons on training wheels. Like that school to prison pipeline is very, very real. The, the systems are very similar. And some of us just don't fit in that system. You know, it, maybe school helps some people. Maybe the medication helps some people. It wouldn't have been good for me. And uh, the whole time, man, I was I just felt disconnected. I, I didn't feel um, validated. You know, I, I did not feel loved. I did not learn until I got older that love is really important. You you could you could give a, a a loving black woman one room and a bunch of books, and she could educate kids better than the damn public school system. In fact, in Chicago, there's 55 schools where they do not have one single child that can read or do math at grade level. 55 schools. This is you're talking about 100,000 kids or something like that, right? So so the love was what was missing, man. I didn't feel like anybody cared about me. And I think when 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 you let a child know you care about them, they're going to show up for you. They're going to want to behave for you. They're going to want to do well for you. I didn't feel love, so I was like, fuck it. I'm just, I'm just coming to school and just do whatever I want. And uh, and and then it wasn't until I turned 18 and uh, I discovered this thing called sex. And uh, I had a baby at 18. And and at that time, I only had three choices. My father said, you, you got to leave in six months. So you can either. So I, my three options were to go back and work at Taco Bell. I didn't want to be pimped. I didn't want to get told what to do. Uh, you could join the military. I didn't want to get shot. <laughs> and then and the war was about to start in Iraq. So, so I went Taco to Taco Bell. Yeah, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> so you went to Taco Bell? No, nah, man. I you went, didn't work at Taco I, well, Bell? I did work at Taco Bell, yeah. but when I turned 18, I went to college. Okay. And when I got to college, I was out of place. I, I felt like a fish out of water. I did not feel like I belonged because, I mean, why would I be in college? I, I couldn't even make good grades in high school. I never made a, I never made an A in anything. I think I might have made an A in PE or something. Well, you made A in sex. I made an A in sex. Yes, yeah. I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> she, she will confirm that, I hope. But anyway, so 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 I get to college, right? I didn't know what I was doing, man. I, I would see, you know, and the funny thing was I started learning. In hindsight, it's like I was around people that maybe they weren't smart, but they knew how to look smart. They knew how to look the part. They had the backpack with the little glasses and carrying all the books. And and I was more like an athlete or whatever. I, I, I did sports and stuff, and school wasn't my thing. But I knew I needed to get an education because uh, because that's what I had been told my whole life. I was leaning on what my parents had always said to me. I just never listened. <clears throat> and uh, and so and I had this baby, right? So I was like, okay, I know I don't want to be broke, I don't want to get pimped, and I said, okay, I think school is the way for me to get what I need so I can be successful and be able to be there for my child, right? So uh, the problem was I did not know how to study, but that was my best advantage actually, because I had nothing to base it on. So 
in my mind, I said, okay, um, how long should I study every day? And I thought about my job at Taco Bell where I would work eight or nine or ten hours because I was a hustler at the job. I wanted that minimal wage money. You know what I mean? I always had money because I was always working. So I was like, if I can work at Taco Bell on my feet for 10 hours, I can study for five hours. Like, I thought I, that was like a half a day, right? And then um, I learned from sports. See, sports is very valuable in terms of teaching you things like, you know, uh, uh, goal setting, uh, consistency, hard work. You know, you learn all these things from playing sports. So I just applied those same principles to academics. Right. So in my mind, I didn't think of like going to the library and studying. I was in my mind, I was like, I'm going to practice. And I would go to the library every day for five hours. Again, scared to death, you know, just trying thinking I was just barely surviving. I did not know at the time that most college students don't study. They study like two, three hours a week and then they try to cram right before the test. So I was way ahead of everybody, right? And and I and, and to my surprise, I, I was the only black student on the University of Kentucky campus that had straight A's. And I had almost a perfect GPA all the way through college. I was the number one student. And the whole time I felt like a big fraud. I felt like I was like, I'm not, I'm not smart. You know what I mean? I didn't realize that I might have some intelligence until maybe uh, my senior year or something like that. Then I started thinking, okay, maybe I was lied to my whole life. Maybe those teachers that were telling me who I was were misidentifying me. And then I started thinking about how many other millions of black boys this happens to. You know what I mean? So so once I figured that shit out, once I knew that I was smart, oh, man, you weren't going to stop me. I, 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 You know, and that's what it is. It's like coming into yourself where you find out who you are, you know? And I'm like, wait a minute, y'all, y'all, y'all were derailing me from my purpose. Now I know what my purpose is. So I never trusted those systems ever again because they destroy our people. How demoralizing was it to you to have your own teachers tell you that you wasn't good enough to make it to college? And how long did you stay in special ed? Um, I don't even remember, man. I, I don't even, I didn't even keep track of what I was in or what I was in. I mean, I were you in there for a year or two? Or you remember most of your academic career as a, an under? It was, it was a big part of like elementary school mostly. So, so, so it was that experience that made you think that you was like really not that intelligent. Them, them, them reiterating that to you. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I just think that generally speaking, that system is it's a racist system, man. It does not it does not bring the best out of any of our kids, man. You look at the stats on black boys in public schools, it's terrible. You know, so um I I don't remember exactly how I was classified in, in, in certain uh sectors. I do remember being in special ed for a while, but I didn't even know what it was. I just know they were like, okay, you should be in this class because you're not as smart as the kids did that are you, in this class. Did, did you ride the short bus? No, I did not ride the short bus. Why is that funny, man? I, I mean, I went <laughs> <laughs> the short bus. I mean, I well, the short bus know, is you, funny. Did you ride the short bus? Um, I didn't ride the short bus, no. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, man, y'all don't come after me, man. Don't come after me. I, I'm, I'm a journalist. I'm a journalist. Okay, so let's talk about the these the, the de dollarization mm. uh, that's going on right now. You got China, you got India, you got Brazil, you got uh, South America, you got Russia, all pulling away from the U.S. dollar, mm. and they're trying to start their own central centralized dollar. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about that, and how is that going to impact Americans? So far, let me just say this. They, <laughs> China and, and Russia and all, they, they've been trying to get away from the dollar for a long time. Um, are they going to succeed at some point? They might. Um, I think that as you process this, I would avoid the alarmist thinking of like, okay, this means the dollar is going straight to hell. Uh, there are reasons to be concerned, though. Um, for example, during the pandemic, we spent way too much money. Uh, the debt levels of this country are unsustainable. Uh, in, the, in 1960, if you measured U.S. debt to, to GDP, which is almost like a debt to income ratio for, for regular for regular people, it was like maybe 50 percent. Now it's like 120 percent. And what's coming up, actually, is the Democrats and Republicans, the idiots we have in Congress, are going to be fighting over the debt ceiling. And they so basically it's just this big game of economic chicken that they play. And usually one side yields and they eventually come to a compromise. They may there may be a point where they don't come to a compromise, which means the economy kind of goes off a cliff a little bit because the U.S. government starts defaulting on its interest payments. That is a, a significant problem, right? Now, in terms of other countries moving away from the dollar, um, this has been in motion for a long time. 
Uh, the United States, one thing that the U.S. has done well uh, in terms of uh, money and capitalism is we just have some of the best financial markets on the planet, just the, the most liquid, most everything. So even when people try to move away from the dollar, it's, it's going to be very, very hard for them to do that. So it doesn't mean they won't set up alternative economies. Uh, what they're basically forming, you talk about BRICS, uh, um, Brazil, Russia, uh, India, China, and uh, South Africa. Is uh, they're, they're doing what I, I've encouraged black people to do. They're, they're just forming another economic gang. You know, most economics in economic warfare is gang affiliated. You know, uh, you have uh, Apple. Apple is a gang. Like what, what I call the gang. Well, because they got a, a bunch of people working toward the same goal. They have a code of conduct. They have the same little logo, the same mission, right? They, they have rules. If you break the rules, you get kicked out of the gang. So effectively, uh, NAFTA, NAFTA was an economic gang. We got together with Russia and uh, excuse me, not, uh, uh, Mexico and Canada and said, let's, let's, let's create a coalition, right? Um, a lot of the black community struggles economically because we don't always have a gang. Like your family's supposed to be your first economic gang. That's where everybody in the family- Man, stop. What? Say that again, man. Your, Say your, that again. Your, your family is Damn. your first economic gang. You man, know, I, I, I got pick up. Feel free to pick up from where you stop. But uh, sure. but listen, I gotta say this, bro. Why in the hell do we have this idea that we can't work with family when most families, most people in this country who are rich, who are wealthy. They got wealthy with their families first. Yes. They didn't get wealthy with strangers and outsiders. They got wealthy with their family. That's right. Why do we buy into this ignorant ass slowpoke narrative that we can't work <laughs> with our family? Because you black and you've been traumatized like like a motherfucker. Wow. Being black is in, in America has been hard as hell. Uh, the things that have been done to us have never been done to anybody. The things we've gone through, no one else has gone, ever gone through. Um, we need to heal. You know, we show up, we, we're traumatized, we re-traumatize each other. Family members traumatize each other. In the black business school, uh, we created, just because to deal with that issue, we actually created the first ever black financial therapy department where we got the, the, black, the best black therapists to help deal with things like financial trauma, financial anxiety, all these things that we don't talk about because trauma is so normal for us that we don't even, we just think that's part of being black. We had like the trauma Olympics. Like, well, well, you you don't know what it's like to be black. When I was a kid, we didn't have no food in the house, and I had to go steal from the neighbors just to eat every day. You know what I mean? And you yeah. know, we had so many roaches and da da da. You know, like that's kind of like our story. Is what, we, what'd you call it? The black what? The trauma the tr Olympics. The trauma Olympics. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's what we do. We wow. we really think that that if you had like if you black, think about this. If a, if a person's like, well, I'm black, and I had a pretty good childhood. I had two parents. We had plenty of money. Life was good. You know, people think that you're weak, or they think something's wrong with you. Mm. Like, oh, well, you ain't really never gone through nothing. Let me tell you what I went through. And the thing I, I learned over time, because uh. I, I was heavily traumatized, too, Um what I learned is that it ain't supposed to be that way, man. It ain't you ain't supposed to have like four friends that got killed before you finish yes, high school. Man, it, preach. You know, preach. You, you're supposed to have a father in the house. <laughs> you're supposed to have enough food to eat. Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean? Hey, uh, Memo, can y'all bring a collection plate in here right quick, man? <laughs> come on, come on, Pastor. Come on, preach, man. Man, you, you know, it ain't supposed to be like that. And 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 what we gotta do is you have to make a decision that that it's gonna stop with you. That in my generation, I'm going to do the work to end these curses that we pass on to each other. And that trauma, see, here's the thing about economics. Traumatized people have a hard time just even doing business with each other because a good economy requires trust. Let me give you an example. Uh, the reason we go into recessions a lot of times, the reason we might have a recession coming up is because we had these bank failures, right? Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, all these banks failed, right? Well, banks... Uh, are, are are afraid now of lending money. A lot of banks have kind of froze up the lending, right? Especially regional banks. So they're like, man, if we if we let this money go, we might not get it back. Or our depositors might bail on us and do a run on the bank, right? So this can actually cause the next recession because you need bank lending in order to make the economy run. And then, But then when consumers are like watching the banks fail, what do you do? <clears throat> well, you're like, man, I got to get my money out of the bank. I can't, you know, or, or I'm not going to go buy anything because I don't want to, I might lose my job, right? So all this fear, right? This fear 
causes everybody to just sort of be afraid to deal with each other, right? Like it's, it's like a virus. And all that shuts the economy down because, <clears throat> because trust and the free flowing of resources is what makes an economy move, right? So the black community, when you have a family where you're like, okay, I don't loan money to relatives because I loaned money to my cousin and he didn't pay me back. I had to go kick his ass to get to get half my money back or whatever. Or or you're like, I don't do business with family because da 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 because they you know they steal from me or whatever. You're violating that trust and creating that that fear of each other that disallows you to even build anything together. You know, how, and that and that's huge. How do you not exhibit fear, but still? have a certain amount of precaution so that you don't hurt yourself financially. I think that there's a thing called calculated risk, you know, and uh, calculated risk means that uh, I am courageous enough to trust, even though I know that there's some chance I may get hurt. I may get burned mm. like, like love, like love can't happen. If you don't have trust, if you, if you are so traumatized by your previous relationships that have never healed, you can't really properly love somebody because love requires you to put yourself out there. You know, you, you know, okay. you know, you, you have to be vulnerable, right? So, so you either can go through life and just be an island and and just keep up walls and keep everybody away, or you can you can process properly process. See, that's the thing. And my wife is really good at talking. About, this is this is the benefit of being married to a therapist because you know, and and I get I get pissed off because she ends up a diagnosing with me. A PhD. Yeah, she well she diagnoses me, man, because um. I took this test. It's called the ACES scale. I think everybody should take this test. It's ACES. It stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And it basically measures how traumatized you are. And I took this test. My wife said, well, if your score is above a three or a four, that's pretty bad. I think I was like a seven. <laughs> I said, no, mm. God. You know, so 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 a lot of that, 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 that ability, uh, and what she told me, I remember was, she said uh, that a bad experience is not necessarily trauma. She said, trauma is when you have that bad experience, but you could not properly process it. So if you can go back and look at the, the most horrible shit that ever happened to you and process it properly, maybe with an expert, maybe get a therapist or whatever, then it, it helps you to kind of heal and just sort of understand it and accept it so you can kind of move forward as a normal person in life. And so doing business with people is, again, it's just like forming relations with people. It's all the, it's all the same dynamic. Uh, if, you can't, if I can't put myself out there knowing that sometimes it ain't going to work out, then I'm not going to be successful. I mean, you know, in the black community, man, we all bad things happen to all of us. See, man, now you're trying to take my job. You know, I'm the gangster love, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm the cleanup man, all of the above. But, man, you just struck a nerve, man, and you really coming into my territory. So I got to bust back on this because uh, otherwise, now you get another tight under your belt, relationship <laughs> guru. So let me try to... Bring the people back home for a moment. <laughs> Hate on you a little bit, but no, really. In, in all in all seriousness, man, I can't even imagine not desiring love. Mm. Like you know, look, man. I've I've been in relationships in the past. Some worked, some didn't. Mm. I've had my heart broken. I've broken some hearts, but I cannot fathom not desiring a woman and being in love that feeling mm -hmm. I, you know that feeling of being in love see and I know it's a sucker out there right now it's a simp the true simp are the ones who oftentimes call real men who know how to take their bitter with their sweet and accept accountability a simp right they're the ones that say he's a simp he's simping he's simping right. that's all the word I, I I just thought about something. The reason why a lot of times they say that word because they have limited vocabulary. Mm. Yeah, that's that's it. They ain't got no other words. But yeah, man, I can't imagine like being that traumatized. Well, I don't want to be in love. I don't want to feel loved. Mm. Or I don't want to feel love. Well, love is one of the most fundamental needs of a human being. But I think there's some people that 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 train themselves. To, to feel that way. And I think when you talk about that, that whole simp thing, um, what's interesting to me is I think that it comes from not having, uh, if you, if you hear a man that uses that term, 
first of all, it's a man who's probably had his heart broken, right? He's he's, he's referencing a time where he got traumatized. You know, but there I, is such thing as simps, though. There know? is there is a thing. There's yeah. a thing, right? Yeah. And and I think and I think that conversation can happen, right? But I think that it's 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 definitely problematic if you think that being kind to a woman automatically makes you a simp, right? Right, and that's the problem, right? right. Because if if she's a sturdy woman and she's really down for you, then you do better by treating her well right. than by you know mistreating her, right? <laughs> now, now what has to happen though is that out of love for yourself, like the first love has to start with you, and if you love yourself, then you don't give that sort of love and treatment to just anybody and everybody. You don't mm. sell yourself cheap. So, um, so generally speaking, if you talk about that simp term, maybe it might be a person who um, who does anything for anybody and everybody, even people who don't respect that person back, right? Almost like um, a male version of a hoe. You know, we talk about a woman. That, what's the difference between a woman that we call a hoe versus uh, a woman that just has a healthy amount of sexuality? If you really think about it, you know, there's a lot of good women who are not going to be out in the street telling everybody what they can do in the bedroom, but they're just as good as the prostitutes and the porn stars. You know, they got all these skills necessary to please a man in the bedroom, but they're not sharing that with every man. There's a wall to climb. There's a standard to meet. If you meet the standard, then you get access to these things, right? Uh, whereas you have some women who are like, I'm going to go put it on OnlyFans, right? <laughs> or, or I'm going to go on Instagram and let every man know uh, what what I got going on. And, and I think that's where we draw that line, right? So I think the same thing might be true with men. Um, I think every man should have a side of himself where uh, with the right woman, you treat her like she's a queen, a goddess. You 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 give her every pedestal that she's earned in your life. There has to be that side of you, but uh, but but you have to earn that, right? So like my wife has earned that. You know, I will submit to her. The people talk about the word submission. Uh, as a married man, I think that that goes for both people. I watched my father and my mother constantly submit to each other. You know, my father wasn't a you know a weak man at all. You know, he he has my father has killed people on many occasions. So he's as tough as he needs to be. But he always saved that tenderness and, and protective energy for my mother and, and put her on that pedestal. And so that's what my, my model was, right? And I think that for some of our young men, the challenge they have is they didn't have a model. You know, maybe maybe you the reason you think that, um, like, for example, you'll hear a guy say, uh, man, you, you, if, you, if you marry a woman that's got kids, you, you a simp. Why are you going to take care of some other man's kids? Well, maybe part of it, I bet you 99% of the time, those are guys who grew up without any man that ever took the time to to care for them, you know. And because I I grew up seeing an example where this man took care of me and I wasn't his child, you know. But but he said when he met me when I was three, he said that's my son. I'm not letting anybody question that. We never used the word step, none of that, you know. And that gave me a type of security that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Otherwise, I'd just you know been trying to figure it out. Man, I'm so glad that you mentioned that submission thing because. Both men and women who are in healthy relationships submit. We just do it in slightly different, subtle ways, right? Uh, traditionally, when we talk about a woman submitting, we talk about her being, you know, cooperative, basically kind, gentle, mm -hmm. a woman who perhaps cooks, clean, take care, takes care of the home. Well, a man would submit in other ways, in a more manly fashion that we consider to whereas he submits to providing, protecting, mm -hmm. uh, being generous, you know, being kind, not being domineering. Mm -hmm. See, some dudes think that being a man means that you have to be domineering. Mm -hmm. And that is a huge misconception. I wouldn't want to be that kind of way with anybody, especially somebody that I lay my head next to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I think um, submitting, um, when I think of submission in my marriage, my goal is to submit to the relationship. I think if you're not ready, because when you start a relationship, it's just like starting a business with somebody or or whatever. You, you're, you're creating this thing together. And so you have this higher objective that should be bigger than both of you. Um, the worst thing to do, in my opinion, is to walk into a relationship with too much ego. Ego and selfishness will kill the relationship because there's going to be times where your ego is going to make, tell you to do something that's not beneficial to the relationship. So you have to make a decision. Okay, do I want to win this argument or do I want to stay married? 
You know, and, it, and it's no different from being like on a football team. It, the worst thing in the world is to play on a football or basketball team with a guy that has too much ego. You know, then then you end up like, I don't know, Russell Westbrook or something. And you, you can't win a championship because you don't understand that your stats are not as important as the team actually winning the game. Mm. Right. No disrespect to Russell. He's a great player, but I don't think he's ever going to win a championship. You know, uh, and so is he really a great player? I think he's good. He's able, he he can put up stats, right? Him and him and Harden, when, when him did, didn't him and Harden play together for a while? And when those two guys were on the same team, yeah, I, I, maybe yeah, they, they played. Uh, yeah, they played together in Oklahoma. Was it Oklahoma? Yeah, and that's when I knew yeah. I said this team will never win a championship because these are two guys that care about their stats. They don't. I don't think they care as much about the team winning as they care about their stats. You know, and whereas a LeBron. He he got the stats, but he's also got the championships, right? So it's a mindset, right? So 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 ultimately, Kobe Kobe was the same way. All, all these guys, all the all the champions, kind of understand that balance. And even Jordan had to learn the balance because remember, in the eighties, Jordan could not win a championship because he was he was Westbrook basically. He was scoring all the points, and the Bulls weren't winning. But then when he started realizing he was a part of something bigger than himself, and he had all these all these other moving components that needed to be managed in order for them to win. Well, that's when the Bulls couldn't be stopped. Well, there's also guys out there who have been very, very good scorers, right? Hmm. But they can't win championships. I mean, for example, Charles Barkley. Yeah. Very good scorer, <laughs> scorer, but he could never win a championship because he had a limited basketball IQ. And you can, <laughs> and, and you can also see that when he does his analysis on TNT. Some of the things that he say – are so absurd, and, and you look, you can see Shaq and Kenny looking at him like, yeah, but where your ring, bro? You didn't get a ring because of stupid thinking like you're doing right now. Some of those guys just don't have a very good basketball IQ. Yeah, they, they're talented. They can score. They can right. rebound. They can go up and down the court and all that stuff. But they don't know when to pass, when to shoot, where to be at when it's mm. time to make that shot. When it's time, when we, they don't know when, to, they don't know how to manage their clock right. All mm. of these things, all of these things factor into your basketball IQ. And right. they just don't have that. The bottom line is they don't have that. And I said the same thing about Westbrook. I was like, this dude can score. He can be dominant. But mm. I don't think his basketball IQ is that good. I would agree with that. You know, I, I think – uh I think generally speaking, and, I, and another one I, I, th- I think about is like uh, Tracy McGrady and how amazing of an athlete he was. But I also think it, t- it takes a certain type of toughness mentally. Well, I think I think Tracy McGrady uh, was injured a lot in his career. I think mm-hmm. that's what slowed him down more than anything. And mm-hmm. then, you know, he never really had a team around him, you mm-hmm. know. And when he did have a team, he was injured. You know, right. That's 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 my take on on on, on, on Tracy. But let, let's talk about investing. Okay. One of your favorite topics. Yes. Let's say I got a thousand dollars, and I need to do something with this money. Mm-hmm. How do I turn a thousand dollars into passive income? Uh, well, the the best way to do it if if I if I was eighteen years old again. And I had a thousand dollars. Going to college was nice, and, and the education, and all that was cool. But I, I did education because I wanted to make money. I that was the only way I knew. Only way I knew to make money was to um, go to school, make good grades, and get a good job. That was the only play I knew. Um, but if I was eighteen again, I don't know if I'd go to college or not. But I definitely would have spent all my time learning how to be the best entrepreneur I could possibly be, for two reasons. One. Uh, that would maximize my probability of one day doing something that elevates my income substantially, right? You you just got to come up with one idea that works. You ain't got to have a thousand of them, right? And then um and then, and then two because I was a, I'm a black man, right? And as a black man, I don't think these Americanized systems are designed for you to have the same opportunities that you would get if you were white. And I think it's a myth and a lie and it's complete bullshit that we've been taught as black men that somehow uh, I can go work in a white man's business and he's going to treat me as if I'm a white man. <laughs> ain't, ain't no other ethnic group. There's no ethnic group on the planet that believes that you can work with another group and have them treat you the same as if you're part of that group. There's no Chinese man on earth that thinks I can go work for an Arab and, and be treated as if I'm an Arab. 
because he knows. He's like, no, I'm Chinese. You're, I'm Asian. You're Arab. We can help each other. But ownership does make a difference. I think black people... Uh, again, going back to public school, the brainwashing that occurs in public school, we just fed this myth, civil rights movement, civil rights, this and equality, all this other bullshit, and it doesn't work. And then when it doesn't work, we get pissed off. You know, that's when we, we get online, all oh, these white people, they treat us bad. Look at look at how they treat look at how they treat the black man versus the white man. Oh, that's true. And when I learn to accept that shit that they don't love you, that's when I realize, okay, I get it. If I want to be a king, I gotta learn how to build a castle. Because I don't think mm. another man is gonna bring you into his castle and make you the king. That's not realistic. You know, like like mm. if you move, you and I are great friends, right? If uh, if I if I say, hey Willie man, hey I I need a place to stay, and you stay in there with your family, and so and you say, okay boy, sure you can stay with me since you know you you're having a tough time, right? And I say, oh, oh by the way, man, um. I want to use the master bedroom. Uh, can you sleep? I, I'm in the basement. It's comfortable. Can you stay in the basement? I'm sleep in the master bedroom. Is that okay? You what are you gonna say? Hey man, uh, <laughs> can, can somebody go find boys? Cause I got an intruder in this motherfucker. And I'm about to pop him up right now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> right, right. So, or well, if I came in, I'm like, man, I don't, I don't like the furniture in here, man. You gotta, we gotta get rid of this furniture. I, I got, I ordered some new furniture, and and that, I mean, it would be crazy for me to do that, right? Um, you know, even though we're friends, you would say, no, boys, th this is not your house. You know, you're welcome here and you can use the spare bedroom, but you can't, you know, I'm not going to treat you like, like you're like, like your son is out there. You know, your son is your son. I'm not your, uh, you know, I'm, I'm your friend, but it's, it's, there's a, a limitation to that. That's my point, right? You would say at some point you would say, okay, boys, you got to go to your own house. You know, where, where do you live? Right. And I think that as black people, we are trained to be economic orphans. We don't have. Um, we remember we own more businesses a hundred years ago than we own now. We we own more land a hundred years ago than we own now. Something happened in the civil rights movement where they fed us this 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 myth of equality, where we traded in land ownership and business ownership for student loans and corporate jobs. And it, and then what happened is we found ourselves in debt traps. We found ourselves stuck on the corporate plantation where you work 30 years at some company, you die at your desk, and then you have nothing to show for it. What is the number one money trap that people make, that they walk into, that keeps them poor? Uh, there's a few of them. Um, one of them is uh, the student loans. Student loans are a, a massive uh, problem in this country. It's a massive economic virus. Uh, they're never going to cure it. Uh, it, so, so student loan debt is uh, something that keeps a lot of people from. That's what causes a lot of uh, m the more educated black people to have a negative net worth when they die, because uh, they, they never pay the student loans back. Half of all black college graduates default on the student loans, and when you default, that means you're gonna have bad credit. That means you're gonna be de in debt for life. You can't write your student loans off in a bankruptcy. Joe Biden actually helped pass that law about 20 years ago, where they they everything else you can write off student loans you can't. So student loans are a big problem. Um, I think a lack of, of financial literacy. Uh, I, I think uh, I have a new book. It's called The Ten Commandments of Black Economic Power. And one of the commandments is that uh, is that economic intelligence should be the right, a rite of passage for your children, that you should train them uh, at an early age on all the different ways to make money. See, a lot of us grow up like I did. I grew up in a household where uh, if you talked about making money, it was get a job. Yeah, that was it. That was the only move we had. So imagine being a basketball player where you've just got one move. Well, it's easy to play defense on a player that has one move. It's easy to shut that player down. Mm. Uh, so we get shut down because we got one move. The the whole get a job move, or or you know, and then you you know the only way to make more money is either get a better job, get a raise on your job, get a promotion on your job, or get a second job. Those that's the only thing you can do. Whereas this, the ways people make money, uh, how do people get rich in America? They get rich through three major areas. Stock market participation. Uh, every study on earth shows that people who invest in the stock market regularly have more wealth than people who do not. Real estate ownership. Owning property uh, is, is, is uh, the difference between poor and middle class. That's real estate ownership. Uh, the third is entrepreneurship. This is the play for the black men, in my opinion. Uh, the, an entrepreneur, I've seen people go from a job making three, dollars $4,000 a month to making literally $100,000 a month because they sell in CMOS now, or they figured out that they could sell a hair care product or whatever. One product, literally. 
So so if I if I'm talking to my kids right now, if I or if I'm having if I was 18 again, you know what I would do I would, I would meet a, a, an amazing black woman and I would say let's have about six or seven kids because the number of kids you have can be part of your wealth if you raise them right, right? If you raise them to help support the family, take care of the family, right? Mm. So I say let's have six or seven kids. We're going to educate our own kids, so we're going to homeschool our kids, and we're also going to build the family business within that infrastructure. See, people don't realize if you add up the number of hours and the amount of resources that you give away to corporate America when you send your kids to work for other people, it goes up into the millions. Like, think about it. You spend uh, 40 hours a week at your job, over a 50-hour week, or 50, 50, week, uh, 50 weeks in the year, that's 2,000 hours a year. Over a decade, that's 20,000 hours. If you work 50 years, that's 100,000 hours of labor. If that labor is valued at, say, I don't know, let's say, 100, let's say $50 an hour, well, then 100,000 times 50 is $5 million. So that's $5 million of resources that you've given away to corporations. You know, so you'll have families like that where you have three or four educated people or skilled people that will all go and work separate jobs and they all struggling. Right. Student loan debt, paying rent for the rest of their life, owning nothing. Right. Whereas if you were able to sort of shift the mindset and say, let's all get together and let's form something together. Let's create an economic gang. Let's let's start a family business together and let's take that expertise and that intelligence and those resources and networks and bring them together to support the family. Then guess what? All that's being poured inward. And next thing you know, the family's doing well. And this, this is and, th- and I know this is real because this is this is what I see in my own family. My parents don't have to worry about retirement. My father wanted the house paid off. I said, how much is it? We wrote a check for that. You know, my mother, my mother's uh, older. She's having some health issues. The, the, they don't need the retirement money because they got three children who are uh, skilled, uh, who have some resources, who are dedicated to the family. That is their retirement plan. It ain't just Social Security and everything else. So systems are in place and they're, they're fine, but systems were designed to kind of replace the family. The family can do a lot of the things that these, mm. these fake systems can't do. Yeah, uh, credit card debt has to be another one of those money traps. Mm-hmm. Right? When you think about, let's say somebody has $10,000 in credit card debt and they have a 25% APR. That could keep you in the poorhouse for a long time. Oh yeah, credit card debt is bad, and uh, and that that comes to the mindset of um, where you in America, you're trained to be a consumer. You're trained to buy, 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 spend, 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 waste, waste, waste. Um, and the reason is the reason they need to train you to be a consumer is because people don't know seventy percent of the economy is driven by consumer spending. And what's crazy is that in America, as wages have gone down, like real wage, if you if you measure against inflation. Wages have gone down. Uh, corporate profits keep going up because that's that's how they make their money. The cost of products and services continue to go up. Right, right. And so the cost of everything's going up, but your wages are going down to staying flat. Well, how do you support that? Well, you go deeper in debt. So a lot of Americans are, are in major, major debt. A lot of it's those high interest credit cards that you talk about, and um, and it's 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 a terrible trap. So yeah, you're right. It's um, credit cards. Uh, so so really, the way to deal with that, in my opinion is I think you have to really, again, get off the tracks, get out, get out of the systems. You know, uh, think about when you're buying something, why you're buying it, and, and how much you're spending, and, and just the basic idea of being committed to living below your means. That right there makes all the difference. So financial freedom, a lot of people think that to be financially free, you got to be rich. That's not true. Uh, you and I both know a lot of rich people who are economic slaves. Why? Well, because they're spending more than they're bringing in. Mm-hmm. So being financially free it's really having uh, the freedom to do what you want without money being the limitation. So a person with an average income can be more financially free than a person with an income five times greater than them. It's all about living below those means. If you mm-hmm. can do that, then you're going to be all right. Let's say somebody's in their 40s or 50s and they've been working for a long time, but they haven't saved any money for their retirement. How could they start today to turn things around? Well, you got to start saving. I mean, you can max out. They got um, uh, tax deferred plans in the 401ks, IRAs, all that. You you got to max all that out. Uh, you don't have to retire at 65. You you could work a little bit longer. You know, you you gonna, you may have to do that. Um, also, uh, factoring in the non see people don't understand most wealth in America has nothing to do with money. Most of your wealth is not just your money. It's it's your resources. You know, your family stuff like that. So a lot of people when they go into retirement. Uh, if you, uh, the biggest part of, of my parents' retirement was not their investment in money. It was their investment in people. So mm-hmm. the fact that they invested in their children years ago means now that they're older, their children will step up and take care of them, make sure that the, the gaps are filled in, 
right? So so I think that when when we have the conversations about relationships online and all that and guys calling each other simps and people talking about what they're going to do in, in their relationships, you got to understand that that as you ch- as you switch to different stages of your life, those in, people that you chose to invest in or did not invest in, that's all going to come back later on when you get in your 50s and, and beyond. So um, so I, I would say this to somebody in that situation, you're going to have to be real creative about it. Uh, you, you're going to have to deal with the fact that maybe you didn't do everything you were supposed to do. Um, uh, I think also investing for older people is also about sort of making sure that the next generation does not go through what you went through. Uh, so leaving an inheritance, having the life insurance policy, all that stuff should just be standard. Any man that cares about his family is not going to die leaving the family destitute. You do not do that. That is not appropriate. That is that is uh, ridiculous, irresponsible behavior, and we got to kill that right now. So, um, so, so that's what I would say. Max, max out the savings. Be creative, and you may have to work a little bit longer. The market is down right now. Crypto's down. The stock market is down. How do you convince people, or do you even try to convince people? to invest in the stock market and especially crypto. There's a lot of, a whole lot of skepticism uh, about cryptocurrency. How do you convince people that cryptocurrency, you being an avid crypto investor who has made a lot of money doing crypto, that crypto is not a scam? (laughs) Overall, I know that there's some scam coins out there. There are some scam coins out there, but Mm. how do you convince people overall that the concept of cryptocurrency is not a scam. Well, you know what? I, I, I'm not really in the business of convincing people of, of much of anything. I, I am um, here to share information. I, I want to convince people to get the information so they can think for themselves, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you talk about, uh, let's talk about crypto. As you mentioned, all cryptos are not equal. Uh, there was about 12,100 different cryptocurrencies that disappeared when the crypto winter started because these can't, these coins, these projects were not strong enough to sustain themselves. Some of them were scams and you've seen some big high profile situations like FTX. And I think Shaq just got sued over FTX and it's a $5 billion lawsuit. So just people should understand that's not insignificant. Like and they're it, talking about relaunching FTX. Did you hear? I know you heard about that. I right? did hear about that <laughs> and they, and they could believe it or not, they could pull it off, but I wouldn't touch it. Right. I wouldn't right. touch it. That's a, it, there's a lot of stigma Man. attached. Yeah, but 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 that like that five billion dollar lawsuit with with Shaq and Tom Brady and, and everybody else, that's not a tiny amount of money. You know, if they really won five billion dollars, that would wipe Shaq out. You know, like uh, hopefully his assets are protected and all that. But still, you know, so 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 the, so the point is to say that with crypto, the bright spot to me is that even as all the other cryptos were just plunging straight to hell, Bitcoin remained pretty strong. The fact that Bitcoin stayed above 15000 per coin. Remember, 15000 was a massive price for Bitcoin just a few years ago. It, wasn't, it was unheard of for Bitcoin to hit 15000 right? So the fact that Bitcoin maintained so much of its value during the crypto winter tells me that once the economy changes, because this too shall pass, economic conditions change all the time, that once things change, the sun comes back out, people start feeling good again about investing, they start coming back outside, so to speak, I think Bitcoin's going to go crazy. I think Bitcoin, uh, so so when I'm investing in crypto, I'm hitting Bitcoin and Ethereum. I'm aiming for the quality. I'm not really messing with a lot of coins I don't understand. And the mm-hmm. other thing, too, about crypto is I, I don't put more than 7% of my portfolio in crypto. So people that, you know, put all their money in Bitcoin or something, that's, that's very bad investing because if something does go wrong, you're in trouble. The biggest thing to understand as an investor is you got to understand, it's just like being a, um, an NFL football player. You can't play in the NFL without knowing at some point you're going to get hit. At some point you're going to get hurt. <laughs> you know, it's going to happen, right? Uh, the best you can hope for is that you take a bunch of hits and you win a couple Super Bowls along the way. And that's what investing is. And, and, and so people that think investing is always clean and easy, those are the ones that get that make the biggest mistakes. They get scared. The market goes down. They run away. They sell everything. And uh, and here's the thing. When people uh, try to convince me that, that, oh, this is the big one, the whole stock market is going to crash forever and all that, I just ask them a simple question. I say, can you name one time in American history that the stock market went down and did not come back up? I said, tell me about one time where that has happened. They cannot give me an answer because well, it's never well, happened. Well, and you're absolutely right. And this is why I'm so confident in the stock market. Not so confident 
not so confident in crypto. Although I right. am, although I am an investor, <laughs> a big invest, investor in in crypto, but most people don't believe that crypto is created equal. Crypto is different. You're right. Crypto, the the, the deficiency with crypto, and I'm I'm speaking more as a as a researcher in this field because you know that when I was at Syracuse University, that was all I studied was stock markets and all that. Mm-hmm. The benefit of the stock market is that we have like over a hundred years of history that we can look at in order to understand how it operates in certain conditions, right? Crypto, we don't have that. So crypto um, is the unknown asset. But here's the thing, right? Um, crypto could disappear tomorrow and be gone forever. But what if it doesn't disappear? What if crypto lasts? It's like uh, you, you're one of the uh, the greatest rappers of all time. You're one of the greatest rap group of all time, Ghetto Boys, one of the greatest, right? And uh, and you came, you were rapping at a time where people didn't know if hip hop was going to last, right? right? Remember people right. like, oh, hip hop's a fad, right. it's going to go away, right? It wasn't, right? But it could have gone away. It could have been a fad. You just don't know, right? So why do you invest? Well, you invest because... You're like, well, this thing may not work out, but what if it does? And if it blows up, I don't want to miss it. And think about this: yeah. if you you take you have a, a hundred dollars, you can either take you can either take that money and just spend it, which means you know you're not going to have anything to show for it, or you take the hundred dollars and you say, well, let me go buy some crypto just in case this thing blows up. So if it doesn't blow up, then it gets wasted, just like it would have been wasted if you had spent it. But but if it does take off, then that hundred may turn into a thousand, ten thousand, or more. Right. Yeah. So you just you just don't want to miss the party. Like because that's the problem with investing. People show up to the party late. They they start investing in stuff when they see it in the newspaper. Oh, this is taking off. I'm going to buy some. Well, by then it's too late. You buying, you buying, I'm selling. Exactly. At that point. Exactly. Warren Buffett, <laughs> the, one of the best investors of all time, he said, basically with investing, you want to do the opposite of what everybody else is doing. Right. This is why investing isn't for right. the sheep, investing for the people that can think for themselves. Right. So he said, when other people are greedy, he said, well, you should be fearful when others are greedy and greedy you when others are fearful. fearful. Exactly. And, and, and so when everybody else is running out the door trying to sell, that's when the smart investors are buying things up. You know, because they want to get it cheap. And then when, when mm-hmm. it takes off and it's making money, then all the people are coming to buy it. They're like, okay, you can you can buy mine because I've already made my money. I'm going to get out now because the price is too high. So so you got to think a step ahead of everybody else. You never buy umbrellas when it's raining because that's when the price of umbrellas goes up. <laughs> you buy your man, umbrellas when it's sunny outside. Man, you know what, man? You damn near, you're damn near a, an, anal- an analogy king like a, i mean like expert man you got so many analogies man like did you train yourself to do this man or this is just something that comes natural you know what it was when i when i was teaching college students i had to find different ways to help them understand complex ideas mm. and i was trained that it, that you don't really understand an idea unless you can explain it to like a 5 year old or a 6 year old mm. and what i found about wealth and money and investing is that most of the concepts of investing are things that we've known our whole life But it wasn't, it's just when we see it in a formalized way, it becomes very intimidating, right? Mm. So, for example, diversification means uh, that that you spread your your money out so that, you know, your asset, you don't lose all your money in one place, right? And it it can be very mathematical, very complicated. But really, all it means is don't put all your eggs in one basket. And you know that, you've known that your whole life, right? Or if I talk about risk, everybody knows what risk looks like. Everybody knows what it feels like to be in a risky situation, right? And so rather than explaining it in the formal way, I'd rather relate it to, like, I don't know, dating somebody you think is going to break your heart, you know, because that's more universal and it's easier to internalize it that way. So believe it or not, most people don't realize this, that you are investing every single day of your life. You and I are making an investment of time by sitting here and, and, and doing this podcast. When you get up in the morning and you and you uh, go to see your girlfriend, you're investing in that relationship and you, you're hoping that it, it works out properly, right? Uh, you invest in your health, you know, when you go to the gym or whatever. So we're all making investments and I encourage everybody to understand that, that rule I mentioned earlier that most of your wealth is not money. You have a lot of things in your life that money cannot buy and you're always investing those things, you don't wanna, like, like time. You know, they say time is money. I, time is not money. Time is actually more valuable than money because I've lost money and I've lost time. I could get the money back. I couldn't get the time back. Mm. You know, um, uh, your health. They say your health is your wealth. No, health is more important than wealth. Uh, you don't believe me? If you go ask any ask any billionaire who's on his deathbed, which would you rather have, your money or your health? <laughs> Mm-hmm. Right. He, he, he's going to want his health back. So uh, so so invest in everything and don't just think about the money, because sometimes we we make the mistake of thinking we're poor because we don't have money. 
But man, God has blessed you in so many other ways that you 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 cannot forget that because a lot of people will lose sight of that. They'll go chasing the money, and they say, you know, they losing their health, they losing their their relationships, they losing their their peace. You and I talked about that about how uh, peace is more important than your money. Well, that's an, that means you're investing in your mental health, which which as you and I both know, that's really important. Right. Absolutely. You know what's something else important, man? Another thing that's yeah. very important. It would be very important to me to see. Well, at least know that you and Kwame Brown had a conversation and y'all buried that hatchet. Because you, know, you guys are two of my favorite people. And I just hate to see you guys, you know, bumping heads, you know, like you've done in the past. Is there any way that you guys can, like, you know, reconcile? Oh, I've always said if you brought him in the room, I would shake his hand, look him in the eye and say, OK, what, what, what's going on? Like I, I wouldn't be. I'm not afraid to talk to anybody who disagrees with me, just to find out, like, what did I do to hurt you? You know, um, it's funny you brought up Kwame's name because I haven't thought about it in a while. I didn't understand why he had the issues with me in the first place. Um, I didn't watch the videos he made. I heard he made a bunch of them. Um, I didn't understand it to be honest with you. Uh, and and I, I will say for sure, if I said something that hurt him in some way, I apologize for that. Um, but no, I mean, if you know him and you know me, like if we got on the phone right now and we're talking, I would have, I don't, I don't, I just kind of believe you can't, especially for black men, you can't be carrying around all this vitriol or whatever, man. I, I, if I can, if I can bury a hatchet, I'd rather bury it than pull it out. Yeah. Cause I, I like, I like that, man. I'm glad that you're receptive to that because in my mind, we got enough enemies, like, we need all hands on deck. Yeah. And for me, you know, my, my main criteria for rocking with anybody black is that they love black people first and foremost. Mm -hmm. If you love, and I know both of y'all love black people, see? And so I think that sometimes we're guilty of holding each other to such a standard that we can't make any mistakes. Uh, we can't have a disagreement. We, you can't do something that one of us disagree with. And that one thing that you do is like it's unforgivable. You know, like for me, right. for me, if you love black people, that means you're not hurting black people. Mm. That means that you are an ally and we need all the allies we can get. We need all the allies we can get, both you and Kwame are necessary to the black community. And I'd love to make that happen if I could. Um, and I'm glad, like I say once again, I'm glad that you're, you're receptive to it, man. I know that, uh, I know that the people will want to see that, you know? I'm all for it, man. Yeah. You know, I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't carry, you know, I mean, I don't know, man. I, I just, I, I never understood that, you know, uh, the idea of, being so mad at someone that you are just pissed off 10, 15 years later. I think, again, that goes back to the whole healing thing. Well, it depends on what they did. That's true. You know that, that's true. That's true. <laughs> but, but, I, but I think, but I think, well, right. And, and if it's, <laughs> or if it's something that's like somebody says something, like my ego's not in this, man. I, I don't, I don't need everybody to think I'm a wonderful guy or whatever. You know what I mean? Like I can let all that go. It's more about, um, I think also it helps when you just, when when you back in your when you in your purpose, man, you just you just keep it moving, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody say something, you're like, okay, all right, well, you have a right to your opinion, I respect it, um, but I'm going to just continue charging in that direction. And uh, I've never watched any YouTube videos about me. Um, Kevin Samuels did a video about me. I I saw I watched like maybe 30 seconds of it. It was it was favorable. It wasn't negative or anything. Um, but I just I feel like that's. Um, uh, for me, that feels a little weird, like ego wise, like I need to hear people, what people think about me or think about this or think about, I respect it, but I just don't think it's healthy to be obsessed with that, you know, but I, I could say for on the stack of Bibles, I, I've never watched any video that anybody, anybody's made about because I know people got shit to say. Well, you know, you got a lot to say, man, and thank God people are watching your videos because you bring a lot to the table, man. And I appreciate you sitting here having a conversation with me and sharing 
this information and instructions to help my people navigate through this wild, crazy, beautiful world. Right Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Boyce Watkins. Thank no you. more talk. Thanks for having me, man.